It is 16 minutes past four and we have Dr. John in the studio from Creation Ministries International. Creation Ministries, of course, have their own website, creation.com, where you can go to get all your questions answered. Or, of course, you can send your questions through to Dr. John while he's in the studio or any of the Creation guys when they're uh, they're online with us on Tuesdays. And the number to send your questions through to is 0401 949 949. Just SMS 0401 949 949. Now, good afternoon, Dr. John. Good afternoon, Mick. It's great to have you back in the studio again. And uh, you've got a bit of a, uh, a busy schedule, I believe. You, uh, you're going to be at the Winter Family Fun Fest tomorrow in the dinosaur tent. Yeah, well, that's right. And uh, look, I, I'm just stoked, Mick, that uh, I got an invitation to uh, be involved in it. You know, yeah. it's uh, really, really good. And uh, of course, we uh, led into it last week. We we talked uh, a fair bit about uh, dinosaurs. And uh, I mentioned my uh, one of my regular listeners, Sylvia. Uh, she couldn't listen last week. So hello, Sylvia. I hope you had managed to uh, listen today. But come along to the uh, Family Fun Day at Gosford Waterfront tomorrow, and have a look at uh, the dinosaur tent. You know that'll be uh, that'll be awesome. But look, uh, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit more about them because. We did mention last week how the evidence shows that uh, uh, dinosaurs did live alongside man. Mm. And, of course, that means they couldn't have died out 65 million years ago. And and when you look at the evidence about uh, what's been discovered, uh, you know, uh, soft tissue, blood vessels, red blood cells, you know, uh, all of those things in the uh, uh, dinosaur bones and uh, tissue, and even the presence of radioactive carbon, you know, I mean, that just means that the millions of years is impossible. Mm. It is scientifically uh, impossible. Because scientific instruments that humans believe in and understand, being those you know machines that read the date of carbon or carbon dating, they've pretty much proven if, if they can find carbon inside those bones, they cannot be that old. That's exactly right, because the upper limit for uh, radioactive carbon, a lot of people don't realise this, but the upper limit scientifically of uh, detection of radioactive carbon is in the thousands of years, not in the millions. And uh, so, so uh, if you find it, it cannot be millions of years old. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's based on half-lives. That, yeah, that, that, that's right. Uh, after about uh, a dozen or so half-lives, and a half-life with uh, a radioactive element means that after a, uh, a certain amount of time, the original quantity uh, reduces to half, and then after the same amount of time, another half, and so on. So uh, what's there becomes a half, becomes a quarter, becomes an eighth, becomes a sixteenth, and, and so on. And after about 12 half-lives for radioactive carbon, uh, there are no instruments that can detect it. Because so, there's so little left. There's so little left. And uh, the maximum uh, number of years, even if those years did exist, which we uh, we don't believe they do, is only about 70,000, not millions. Mm. So uh, the presence of radioactive carbon means that uh, whatever you're testing cannot be millions of years old. Yeah. So, so that's it. And, of course, the other thing that uh, we need to remember about dinosaur fossils Where are they found? They're found in sedimentary rocks. Mm. And those sedimentary rocks look absolutely the same all over the world. You know, it's Mm. an absolutely uh, um, uh, similarity globally. What does sedimentary mean? Uh, Well, deposited by water. Uh, Sediment is sand. Uh-huh. Right, so so uh, right, uh, what we've we've got uh, all around us here, you know, bush rock, which is uh, sedimentary uh, rock. Like all those rocks on the freeway heading down to the Hawkesbury. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. All of that is uh, sedimentary layers, and uh, that's produced by flooding. Mm-hmm. And because it looks the same all over the world, we say that the uh, global flood that the Bible talks about is the logical uh, cause of all of that uh, sediment. Mm-hmm. Now. Even the uh, the secular world says that uh, oh it must have been a a global event and uh, they they think it was a uh, an asteroid impact that had global effects I think they uh, they think it probably was uh, in the uh, the Gulf of Mexico mm-hmm. but 
<coughs> they're talking about something that is speculative, whereas we know the evidence is there for a, uh, a, a global flood. Mm. And and the uh, the one described in the Bible really is the um, uh, the one that you'd look at because uh, every culture all over the world has got a uh, a legend about a uh, a global flood. Mm-hmm. This, these are cultures that had never been touched by uh, by the Bible, and yet they have so many things in their flood legends that are very very similar to uh, to the Bible's flood story, mm-hmm. and of course. Uh, that also explains how we uh, can have the evidence that uh, dinosaurs were around after the flood so that people could see them. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, obviously, if people lived alongside them, then they would be able to see them. Mm. And uh, uh, remember that Noah had to take uh, two of every kind of land-dwelling, air-breathing creature on the ark with him. Mm. Now, logically, that included dinosaurs yep. and everything else that wasn't on the ark with Noah, every land-dwelling, air-breathing animal was uh, died out, uh, was drowned in the flood and buried in sediment, which is where we find their fossils. Yep. Now, if they, uh, they did survive the flood, two of every kind of, uh, of dinosaur, why are they not everywhere at the moment? Well... Uh, it's pretty obvious from the Bible's account that the climate is very, very different now post-flood than it was pre-flood. And okay, now you're, you're assuming, though, that some of those dinosaurs didn't die off during the flood because they didn't get on the boat. Oh, the ones that didn't get on the boat uh, th- did die off. Just okay, so, like so they are in sedimentary rock somewhere. Oh, absolutely. Yep. But but there must have been some that survived the flood because Noah was told to take two of every kind. Yep. And of course, when we uh, when we have a look at the uh, the evidence, we see that uh, the the Bible talks about a very very different climate post flood, uh, with seasons like we uh, we experience now. Now, seasons are not conducive to uh, the thriving of large animals, uh, reptiles like dinosaurs were, mm-hmm. because they were uh, cold-blooded creatures. They, uh, that means they, they can't regulate their own body temperature. They have to get their, uh, their warmth from their surroundings, yep. which is why um, reptiles now are not very uh, active during the uh, the winter months because mm. uh, the, you know it's not warm enough for them mm-hmm. and they get very active uh, in the uh, the hotter uh, times but uh, some of them would have survived for a little while and people have seen them and they've drawn pictures of them on cave walls and on rocks and various things like that uh, there's just so much evidence from uh, uh, from uh, drawings and uh, carvings throughout the world of dinosaurs alongside man. Yep. And logically, man must have seen the living animal because he wasn't familiar with the fossils if you go back centuries. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the, uh, that's the evidence uh, for them living alongside man. And actually, everything only makes sense in the light of what the, uh, the Bible says. Yep, yep. Wow. Interesting, because, I mean, we've we've actually got a question that sort of relates to dinosaurs that we'll talk about after the break. Um, But, of course, tomorrow, the Winter Family Fun Fest, you'll be inside a dinosaur tent. And um, I assume being school holidays, there'll be plenty of kids that are going to come in. I would like to ask you a question in regards to the type of questions you get. When kids ask questions, uh, how do they compare to an adult question are they easier to answer or harder to answer or <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they are very very tricky yeah you know yeah kids come up with uh, all sorts of uh, questions that you uh, completely out of left field the things yep. that you you just wouldn't expect anyway we're going to uh, be prepared for that tomorrow yeah uh, because uh, they will they will ask and of course uh Children are absolutely fascinated by dinosaurs. So are adults, yep. but but children are. And uh, the, the, you know, if you give a a kid a dinosaur picture book, uh, they can identify all the uh, the creatures. But of course, we have to remember that they are 
artist's impressions of what they might have looked like. Yes. Because uh, uh, we, we don't actually see the uh, the full body when we dig up a fossil. Usually there's only uh, little bits maybe of soft tissue, but it's mostly bones. Yeah. And, of course, the uh, artist then has to uh, reconstruct what he thinks the animal might have looked like. <coughs> Yeah, like fill in the blanks. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. but there are carvings of them that uh, are very, very lifelike, so we know that people must have seen the live animal. They were able to put the flesh on the bones. Yeah, wow. You are on 94.9. It is 26 minutes past four, and I'm in the studio with Dr. John from Creation Ministries International. We've been talking a lot about dinosaurs, well, the last couple of weeks, and Of course, Dr. John is going to be in a dinosaur tent tomorrow down on the waterfront in Gosford. Between uh, 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., there's a winter family fun fest down there. And there will be a dinosaur tent where Dr. John will be there for a while, which will be exciting for the kids to go and ask all their dinosaur questions. Now, Dr. John, we have had a question that's come through on our our text line. Actually, we've had a couple. Um, And this is from James. says, hi, I want to know if... Tardigrades are for the same era as dinosaur. Do you know what tardigrades are? Yeah, <laughs> I do. Actually. All right, uh, are from the same era as dinosaurs, and are made up of their same DNA. Does human elevate evolution <laughs> come from tardigrades? Uh, I want to know. Uh, sorry, does human evolution come from tardigrades? Did human and dinosaurs? life evolve from tardigrades there you go yeah well (laughs) tardigrades actually i mean that's the sort of question we were talking about before mick you said uh to uh, children come up with uh, questions right out of left field (laughs) and and that one certainly is Yeah. yeah no tardigrades are little creepy crawlies they're only very very small and uh Oh, I suppose they look a little bit like a, uh, a miniature caterpillar, but with uh, with less legs. But, uh, I mean, the question assumes that uh, evolution is true. Well, no, evolution is not true. And uh, tardigrades are just another one of the uh, the little creatures that uh, that God has made. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the, I mean, they're, they're not caterpillars and they're not ants, but they're, they're little creatures anyway. Yeah. So, uh, no, they're not on the uh, evolutionary chain f- to, from dinosaurs to humans or anything like that because there isn't one. Yeah. You know, all of the creatures that God uh, has made are unique creatures. And, uh, yes, there's been some changes with uh, adaptation to environments, but uh, apart from that, no, one thing has not evolved into another. And, of course, uh, th- this is one of the uh, the, the problems. We're, we're so indoctrinated with uh, evolution. Mm-hmm. And, and you sent me an article from uh, The Conversation yep. saying uh, how failure to teach evolution would be immoral. Yes. Well, of course, there's no such failure in our society. It's uh, uh, well and truly taught in schools and everywhere else. But, of course, apparently in some societies, uh, uh, they don't teach it much. In uh, Islamic societies, for example, they don't teach evolution much because they're believers in creation. And uh, so are we, of course, but uh, because we live in uh, our Western society here in Australia, uh, we can't uh, get away from the uh, the teaching of evolution. Mm. But uh, a lot of the uh, the things that uh, uh, the article said, I thought were really amazing. Why would you say that sort of thing? Because uh, they said that in a, uh, a free society, you must have free inquiry. You know, you must not stifle free inquiry. Well, of course, uh, normally it doesn't get stifled. Well, (laughs) over the last couple of years, free inquiry has been stifled quite a bit in Australia. But uh, certainly, uh, and and here we have the... um, Reports only a week or so ago that the uh, the government wants to uh, introduce a law that uh, tells you you're not allowed to um, ha- uh, spread any misinformation or disinformation. Yeah, <laughs> Which, based on who's who's. That's right. You yeah. know who's the expert. Mm. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, it's a bit like uh, George Orwell's 1984, where uh, uh, the hero in that, uh, Winston Smith, I think his name was, he worked in the Ministry of Truth. 
mm-hmm. and the Ministry of Truth's job was to sanitise everything so that uh, you only ever heard what the uh, uh, the mainstream view was, what was the acceptable view. And of well, course, in the news in the last week, we've heard how the Chinese version of, of you know, Christianity they want to export now to the rest of the world. This has been their own. I guess, um, cleaned version or scrubbed version, and, and now they want to export that. Yeah, sanitised, I think, is the, uh, the, the, word. The, yep. the word that we want, Mick. <laughs> and, uh, get rid of all the things that uh, f- uh, any group of people might find objectionable. So when you do that, uh, you know, you get rid of everything that really is in there in the uh, the first place. Mm. So no, we, uh, we don't want to uh, uh, do that. And who really does have a monopoly on truth? You know, uh, uh, we know that uh, the Bible is truth, but um, apart from that, you know, uh, people have uh, all sorts of, uh, of different uh, views about various things. But uh, anyway, we, we trust that that sort of bill doesn't see the light of day because uh, who is the determiner, who is the arbiter of, uh, of truth? Well, in the last 10 years, I reckon truth has been pulled apart more than any other 10 years in, in my life anyway. You know, the way we've seen things that the meaning of words, I won't go into too many of them, but, you know, even me as a man, the meaning of man is no longer man. You know, it's it's just changing. Words are changing. So much is changing. And truth is changing because what was a truth is no longer a truth. Yeah, well... Uh, it- the uh, the world would not have progressed to uh, uh, what it has if there had been such censorship in the past. I mean, it did exist. Mm. Let's face it. Uh, in the time of Galileo, it was believed that uh, the sun and the moon revolved around the uh, earth mm. un- until he said, no, it, uh, it doesn't. But, of course, uh, he was uh, roundly condemned for that because, obviously, it does. Mm. <laughs> you know, when you, because that's the way it appeared to people. Yes. But, of course, uh, G- uh, Galileo, uh, Galileo's uh, observations won out in the end. Mm. But imagine if you had the uh, sort of legislation that we've got now. You know, mm. but, uh, it wouldn't have uh, seen the light of day. So yep. we'd still be in the, uh, the dark ages. Yep. So, really, uh, uh, I, I think, there's just so much intellectual dishonesty on the uh, the part of particularly uh, uh, scientists when uh, where evolution is concerned, mm. and people have the idea that uh, scientists are seekers after truth and they'll follow the evidence wherever it leads. But that's not really what happens, and uh, mm. a lot of the uh, scientific in- investigations really are dictated by money. You know, mm. whoever is uh, doing the funding. And, of course, they can't afford to uh, rock the boat because the paper that they uh, they need to uh, publish won't get written if they go against, uh, particularly with evolution. What, and and uh, talking evol- about money, you, you mentioned this years ago when I first started speaking to you in this segment and, and you said, you know, you just watch. Over the years, you'll see... The oldest of something will be beaten by something else that is older in not much time. And then there'll be something older. And and all I've seen since then, because I've been focusing on it, they constantly come out with similar news to a few weeks ago, but with a different set of bones. And it's older than the last one. And the next one's older than that one. And it's just constantly trying to beat the old oldest. Yeah, well, uh, there is money involved in that, Mick, because... Uh, uh, scientists uh, are as well as uh, they have to live mm. and uh, the university or whatever research institute uh, they work for has to get funding mm. and uh, if they want to uh, get it then they might have to come up with something outlandish so uh, there's always this uh, uh, this attempt to find the things that older or, or whatever than uh, the ones that have existed before. Mm. And, of course, there's a great deal of kudos in coming up with the oldest. Yep. So, uh, and, and you're more likely to have the uh, funds flowing your way if, uh, if that's the sort of thing that you come up with. Yeah. So, so there's a, a, a little bit of intellectual dishonesty has, uh, has crept into uh, science over the years, and that really is a, a, a great shame. But uh, when you think about it, 
the evidence against evolution is is actually overwhelming. Mm. I mean, you never hear that mentioned because mm. uh, uh, people are, uh, you know, praising Darwin all the time. In fact, that article in the uh, the conversation mm. said that uh, uh, what Darwin produced was um, one of the uh, greatest contributions to science ever, if not the greatest. Yeah. Well. When you think about it, what has happened in the uh, years since then, and that's the 160 or so years since uh, Darwin published his, uh, his book on evolution, they really didn't have much evidence to go on then. Mm. And as time has gone by, the evidence has flown out the window. I mean, in his day, they only had uh, fairly simple light microscopes, and they could look under those light microscopes and see little creatures like amoebae or maybe even a tardigrade or something like that, and mm. it looked fairly simple. And uh, they could look at a cell, and there it was with a, uh, a little dark dot in the middle, which was its nucleus, and it looked fairly simple. So they could easily imagine that it might just have arisen uh, spontaneously or develop bit by bit by bit. But they had no idea what the, um, uh, what the complexity inside those little jelly-like things that they saw or the uh, little black dot of the nucleus that they saw. They had no idea of the uh, complexity that goes on inside a cell. Mm. And, of course, uh, they didn't know anything about DNA, and they didn't know that there was this most incredible program that was uh, running all of that. You know, we're, we look at uh, some of the things that are run by computers these days, like uh, uh, motor vehicle manufacture. You know, you walk into a motor vehicle plant and uh, it just looks amazing and there's mm. nobody around. It's all being done by uh, by robots and uh, yeah. obviously computerised. Or you go into a, uh, a warehouse like a Costco warehouse where they're sorting all this stuff. Amazon, I suppose, would be the same. Yep. All of this stuff going on without human interference is all being done by uh, even Coles uh, is starting to do it yeah, inside yeah, their that, that, that's yep. right well uh, it looks amazingly complex and it is but when you compare it with what goes on inside a cell you know, mm. it pales into insignificance beside that. So uh, what goes on in the cell is just absolutely astonishing. And uh, you really, when you look at the, um, um, uh, the DNA program and the complexity of it and the fact that it is, it is so miniaturized, you recognize that only the greatest intelligence outside the universe could have ever, uh, you know, ever designed it. Mm. And uh, even Richard Dawkins has mentioned it his book all of these things look as though they were designed but of course he says they weren't designed you mm. know but uh, that's the other problem with evolution because it has no idea of what the end result is to be or the way to get there it's it's all random chance and a, a few years ago though before we had microscopes and stuff that were as good as they are today you could almost see like if you were just sort of visually imagining one thing with a simple step to the next one but the, the the smaller we can see the more we realize that there's these massive complexities and little machines and all sorts of things going on and you realize that the missing link isn't actually a missing link it's a missing million links yeah oh, <laughs> it, 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 it's it's missing information mick and uh, uh the sort of um computer type information that is so vast that it could never happen you know uh, one of the things that has always intrigued me about the uh, scientists these days they firmly believe that um, dinosaurs evolved into birds mm. now uh, when you think about it uh, they laid eggs and birds laid, laid eggs and when you look at their red blood cells, they have nucleated uh, red blood cells and, and so on. But when you then look at the transformation that would have had to occur from a, uh, a reptile to a bird, uh, they believe it so much now that you often see drawings of uh, dinosaurs uh, with feathers. Yep. But feathers are not the same as scales. Scales are skin folds. Feathers grow from follicles like hairs. It's completely different. Mm. And a feather is not a, uh, a simple structure at all. 
uh, the when you look at uh, feathers under uh, uh, you know very very detailed microscopes, you see all the little interlocking barbules on them and mm. so on and. Uh, a feather is a most amazing structure. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the difference between um, scales and feathers, uh, that's not the only difference between reptiles and, uh, and birds. You know, even if you think of the eggs that they lay, reptiles usually lay uh, soft-shelled eggs, whereas birds are hard-shelled eggs. Mm-hmm. Uh, reptile eggs self-incubate. You know, I mean, the turtle buries the eggs in the sand and uh, uh, doesn't have to sit on them, mm-hmm. whereas birds have to uh, sit on theirs. Mm-hmm. Uh, reptile hatchlings are able to uh, survive by themselves immediately on coming out of the uh, shell, mm-hmm. whereas, of course, baby birds need the uh, nurture of the parent birds for weeks after they're, they're born. I mean, the differences are just astonishing Mm. and when you think that those differences have to have been brought about by a uh, a computer program in Mm. the uh, the dna the amount of program that is required is enormous and according to evolution it can only happen one little uh, change at a time well not one little change one little uh, uh, dna uh uh a nucleotide at a time. That's why I well, say there's millions of missing links, oh, not just oh, one. Oh, absolutely. It, <laughs> it can only go uh, one at a time, and it's got no idea of what direction it's heading in. Yeah. So it's all it's all uh, um, uh, all accidental, and so you just can't get anything um, that is uh, useful out of one little change at a time. It's not going to happen. Yeah. So really, we, if if scientists were intellectually honest and they uh, they looked at what really happens in the uh, the uh, evolution that they believe in, uh, mm-hmm. they would have to say, no, we are deluding ourselves. It's uh, fairies at the bottom of the garden stuff. It simply couldn't happen, no matter how many millions and billions of years you gave it. Uh, uh, everything over time goes in the, in the other direction, doesn't it? It always deteriorates. It doesn't get com- more complex. Yeah. So uh, uh, common sense tells you that it is impossible. Yeah. Well, Dr. John, fantastic. Another awesome week. And I believe we have a different uh, CMI person turning up next week. Um, for many people, though, they'll get to see you tomorrow down at the Winter Family Fun Fest on the waterfront in Gosford. That's between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Dr. John will be in the tent there. And uh, next week, I believe we'll have Dr. Taz Walker, which will be quite exciting. So, um, yeah, we'll have Dr. Taz Walker for a few weeks, and then we've got you back again. Yeah, well, Taz Walker's a geologist. He's very, very uh, good on rocks and uh, and uh, dating techniques and things like that. So for those who've got any questions about the rocks and the uh, dating techniques, send them in for uh, Dr. Taz to uh, to answer next week. Yes, and of course the number is 0401-949-949. That's the number to call, or rather uh, SMS, 0401-949-949. Thank you, Dr. John. Okay, Mick. Well, I'll, uh, I'll see you next time I'm on, which is uh, a few weeks away. Yes, we'll see you then. You are on 94.9. It is four minutes to five.